Um, so <clears throat> let's now move to Christopher Langan, right? So this is uh, someone that came to prominence in the 90s. And he came to prominence simply because he took an IQ test at some point, uh, did very well. I think the, uh, the claim is something like 210. I think some people said that it was a uh, uh, lower, right? Um, an interesting little detail is that he runs this uh, website, Mega Society, and um, more recently he has tried to uh, take like uh, an, an IQ test twice. Once I believe uh, he was accused of taking it under an anom anonymous name, just so he could like prepare for the test. Um, and then a second time under his real name, and he did not score 210 in either instance. But, um, uh, you know, he's an inter inter interesting fellow because uh, in America, but, you know, maybe perhaps the world uh, more broadly, people really place a lot of stock in IQ, right? Um, beyond actually what it measures, right? I, I think it is accurate to say that uh, an IQ uh, does measure, you know, some kinds of intelligence. It does measure some, uh, uh, you know, uh, ability to do uh, uh, puzzles and and whatnot, stuff like that. Um, and it does, uh, like, if you look historically, right? People like Charles Darwin, um, Albert Einstein, and others, they tended to have high IQs, especially like when you look at, you know, the sciences or whatever. When you look at math, but, but um, interestingly, the people who, who are considered the great artists never score as high. So it yeah. show, it shows very much what I talk about: functionary, creationary, and visionary, and how you you can't really measure them. Because I think the only artist it might that they estimate, I don't think they well. I think Dolly had like a 125, so what they may have estimated. And how, how do you estimate that? But anyway. Yeah. And, and interestingly, uh, pe some people with like the highest documented IQs, um, they don't really go on to, it's not that, it's not that, for example, they're not intelligent or whatever, but they don't end up producing things of value i forget the name that i was looking up there's like some person in the uh 20s or 30s that was at the time like the highest known iq in the world and um you read like like he was interested in all kinds of topics like he decided to do a book on you know the influence of like you know native american culture on like you know early american democracy like stuff like that but you know like i was reading like a couple of chapters of the book it's not very well written the arguments aren't really like you know shocking um so there there's this there uh, when you get to high enough levels there does seem to be an inverse correlation between iq and actual accomplishments separate yeah. from simply saying you know i scored well in iq tests which well, isn't well one of the people that's his rivals for the highest iq marilyn vos savant mm -hmm. oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. i heard her what, what has she spent the last 30 years? She's basically been Dear Abby. Mm -hmm. She's been writing a column on... on, on I mean, he, here you are. She has, uh, I think, documented a 220 IQ from what I had, which is higher than his supposed documentation. And she's been fucking Dear Abby. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, 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 I know that when publishers, when they, um, you know, publish books, they sometimes uh, choose their own titles. But I just remember thinking, like, some of the book titles that she chose are, like, very, like, trite and very silly, right? So it's like, it's not, you know, it's, uh, I doubt the content is necessarily all that, all that better, right? So, it, you know, it, it is this odd kind of um, uh, inverse relationship. And before we get to Langan himself... Um, let's just talk about like our experiences, uh, with, with all this, right. Cause we, we definitely have some experience with standardized tests and, you know, uh, kind of like, you know, dealing with like, um, expectations, like one direction or the other. And, um, I, I, in your essays, you mentioned, for instance, that one time you were dragged to take an IQ test, so like, like the Mensa society and some of your experiences there, maybe like we could, we could start with, uh, with, uh, some of that. Well, Back in uh, 92 or 93, uh, my second cousin, well, I guess it would be first cousin once removed, my natural mother's first cousin, so the first cousin once removed, was a woman who was in Mensa. And she was quite smart, and she she was part of uh, of the, the clan that lived up in uh, the Duluth Superior area uh, around the edge of Lake Superior. Uh, and so she... Uh, she came, we met one time, and then a few other times later, you know, we got together. Now, she was probably uh, actually a couple of years older than my birth mother. She was about 25 years older than me. She's dead now. Um, I, I liked her, uh, and she suggested that I take this IQ test, uh, 
to get into Mensa. And I remember the Mensa standardized test then in 93. I do remember the copyright was 1969 when uh, the test was made. And so I took its typical 150 to 200 questions. Uh, and I remember there were probably 12 to 15 questions that I knew what the answer they wanted, but I disagreed with the premise. The two that stick in my mind the most, and you know, as you sort of rethink things, they, they become bigger than they really were, were uh, one was, uh, let's see, one was uh, uh, about how many side, uh, they would have uh, polygons and uh, you have to pick the polygon with, with equal sides, uh, uh, you know, equal number of sides. So it would be, uh, you know, a square, uh, a hexagon, uh, an octagon, etc. And then there was a triangle uh, and then there was also a circle. And they wanted me, of course, to pick the triangle. But I said, there's two possible answers because a, a circle has an infinite amount of sides. And is infinity, is infinity, you know, uh, uh, even or an odd, odd number? Well, it's, it's neither. It's infinity. So I disagreed with that premise there. So I did choose an infinity, I remember. And then the other one was a more social question. Uh, it had four or five choices. It said, what is the odd utensil out or the odd thing out? And so it said on a table, it would have a, a knife, a spoon, a fork, uh, a, a cup, and uh, I think it was a cup and then a saucer. Uh, and uh, or what, what thing that you, uh, it, it doesn't belong here. And I know that they wanted to say, uh, what, I forget what, they wanted me to say one of the other things, but I, I, I haven't grown up poor, said, said, said uh, oh, the, the saucer could be out. So I, and it showed the cultural bias because, uh, you know, the idea implicit is that uh, everyone would have a cup and a saucer, uh, uh, whereas, you know, they'd have to have that. I, I forget what the actual one was, but those two stick in my mind. One with the obvious cultural bias against the people who are impoverished, and the other one, that, that was mathematics. And like I said, there were 12 or 15 questions. And I scored, I think, in the 94th percentile. And you have to be in the 98th percentile. But I'm sure that if I had gotten those 12 or 15 questions had given them, I would have probably gotten in the 98th percentile. But the people in the Minnesota Mensa Society there, or the Minneapolis, the Twin Cities Mensa Society, whatever it was, were, were typical nuts. I remember these two nerds playing chess and almost getting into a fist fight, arguing over who was the better General Leo Grant. And then I remember this attractive blonde woman who was probably a decade, 10, 12, 15 years older than me. I was, I guess, 27 at the time. She was probably 40 ish. And I remember her coming up and I was wearing a turtleneck. And I remember her just rubbing my chest and saying how she liked my pectoral muscles. And I remember thinking, okay. And, and when, the three or four times she came up to me, you know, she was rubbing it. And if I hadn't been there with my cousin, who knows? She might have invited me out back to do her or something. But, but was, didn't she didn't she say that you try to talk to her, but she only wanted to rub, but not have yeah, any yeah. further interaction? Yeah. yeah. And, it, 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 and, and 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 there were there were other ones that that fit this there. And I was like, I was like, I was really surprised because I figured they would be a bit, you know different but they fit the typical stereotype of the nerd geek whatever you want and so that was my experience with it, with uh, mensa and uh, these tests which you know uh, again they i could see w what they wanted me to say but i just on principle couldn't say because i didn't believe that that was just the one correct answer that they wanted yeah um so i mean like uh, when i when i think of like christopher uh, langan's story uh you know, I am I am kind of like sympathetic to his story. Like uh, I I also grew up like feeling like a misfit, right? I I grew up uh, thinking that um, I had talents and I had an intelligence that I couldn't really express in the context of school. Uh, I think back when I was younger, it was more kind of a uh, you know a, a lot of it was probably ego because I mean uh, by the time that I got to the point where I could express something of value, you know, I had already. You know, I was already a teenager uh, in my early adulthood. I started writing, right? So before that, it must have been like pearly ego. But same thing with like Langan, right? He he uh, he grew up um, in poverty. He grew up uh, uh, in an abusive household, and he grew up in a way where whatever you know intelligence that he thought he had, he couldn't really express. 
Um, I forget what he said uh, about his schooling, but I wasn't really good at school until much later, right? So like when I was in middle school, I remember I almost uh, was left back several times. I almost, you know, I, I almost had to go to summer school. I was always like on the verge of uh, failing a class, partly because I just, you know, I just didn't really want to do the work. Not because like I thought I was too smart for it, but I honestly just wanted to do other things, right? I wanted to like go outside. I used to like love going into like the um, uh, the train tracks in, in, in Brooklyn. Uh, I used to, you know, just like, just like do everything other than work. Um, and that only changed at the end of eighth grade where I was like, all right, look, so I was through these classes, like they put me through these like, you know, like algebra math classes. And uh, if I do well on some of these tests, I won't have to take these classes in high school. So since I already sunk three years into it and I didn't learn what I needed to learn, I was like too lazy or too whatever. Let me at least try to do well on this test. So after like, you know, nearly failing everything, I did end up doing very well on the tests. I, I was able to skip a bunch of, uh, of those classes when I got to high school. And when that happened, I actually felt for the first time, like pretty empowered, right? Because again, I wasn't reading books. It's not like I had all these like wonderful complex ideas at the time. Uh, I just look to society as a way to tell me, Alex, like, are you worthwhile? Yes or no. If the answer is yes, you will be able to accomplish this and that. You'll be able to do well on this test. You'll be able to do well in school. You could get into a good college. And because I like that feeling, I remember distinctly trying to chase that feeling. So by the time I got to high school, I kind of, you know, I, I shaped up, I started doing well in school. Um, and, uh, I graduated something like number four in my high school in college, I was a valedictorian. So, um, I, I, you know, I was, I, I became kind of like addicted to that feeling. However, I do also distinctly remember when I was in high school, when I was a junior and I had to start uh, taking the SATs, um, I, I was like, you know what, let me take the SATs blind. Let me not take any practice tests. Let me just like go sit down and see what I would do without any kind of studying. And because at that point I had already like started reading books, right? I had already started like thinking about the world and started realizing, you know what? There's a lot of distinctions between me and how I approach things versus everyone around me. And I want to explore why that is. I want to see if there's any meaning there outside of like my own feelings. And I remember like sitting down to take the test. And when I got back my results, like everything was average. I got like, you know, 500 math, 500 verbal, which was like square in the middle of average. And because I was still kind of like stuck in this idea of, I want society to tell me that I'm worthwhile. I was really upset. I remember I was very uh, upset that I had an average score. So I started like studying really hard for the next SAT. And I got like several books of practice tests. I took probably 30 practice tests. I would do, you know, like entire weekends, just like timing myself. I would put on a clock. And every, you know, uh, time that I would take the test, I was like, let me see if I could do this five minutes faster, 10 minutes faster. And I got better and better and better. And one thing that I noticed when I started taking these tests is I was like, wow, like they're telling me, they're trying to explain to me that the, the answer here, for example, for some like verbal question or whatever, that this is the right answer. But I know for a fact that um, you could really reassess this in some other way. This doesn't have to be the answer, but I know what they're looking for. I know what they want. So I, I really got myself into the mentality of a test creator. Okay. I was like, I know what they're looking for. I know what they want. This is just, this isn't to prove anything anymore. I just need to get these high scores. I need to get to a college of my choice and I need to get into college for free. I don't want to pay for shit. So let me just suck it up and let me do this. I went from literally totally average scores like 510 or 520 to perfect scores, which should be considered a statistical anomaly. This should be considered grounds for like, did he cheat? You're not supposed to go from 500 to 800 simply by studying. And the fact that I was able to do that on the one hand, I was happy because I still had these feelings of like, I want society to like, you know, tell me, Alex, you're worthwhile. You're good. You're good. You're whatever you're just, des you're deserving to also thinking, but I didn't really do anything except spend fucking like three months consecutively do nothing but test taking. 
So by the time that I got to college and I realized, okay, so this is what it's going to be. Um, I was like, I, I'm going to have to like, for me to like survive this for the next four years, I'm going, I'm going to have to like completely eliminate like any feeling of college is going to give me my self def definition. It's going to provide for me some sort of way to build meaning, some sort of way to like feel good about, my, about myself. I need to use this as a means to an end. But I was very depressed in college. I was very much feeling like this is wrong. What they're doing in like, you know, what they're doing in, what they're teaching me about literature is wrong. What they want from me in terms of papers is wrong. The one time that I've given a, a, a perfectly honest paper, the one time that I said exactly what I felt and did exactly what I wanted to do, I got something like a C minus, right? So I, I, you know, I sort of, I, I basically figured out there is a way to kind of game the system. There's a certain set of protocols that you could follow to give people what they want. And in return, you're going to get a piece of paper. You're going to get someone, you know, like saying nice things about you. They're going to look well upon your resume, but I knew that I was kind of like faking it. And what kind of struck me listening to Chris Langan is he's kind of the opposite. On the one hand, it seems like through his interviews that he's like, like, like a total like fucking rebel. But on the other hand, he's sharing these stories that he sees an IQ test and he becomes really, really curious about how well he could do. I never had that feeling. For me, it was the opposite. For me, it was like, I need to get through this, but this is bullshit and I resent having to do this. I also felt this way in college. And yet he takes this test and it becomes his entire identity, right? It becomes his entire identity. Everything that he could point to is, I took an IQ test once, I allegedly scored a 210, and now this is going to be my claim to fame. This is why you know I'm going to go on these TV shows. This is why people will give any kind of shit about me. So he completely latches onto it, right? So I feel like at a certain point, like you know, in our maybe teenage years, or like there's this kind of divergence, right? That um, he's not really willing to talk about because you know we, we, you read anything that he says, or you look at his interviews, it's all ego, 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 right? He doesn't want to be vulnerable. He doesn't want to be honest with others or with himself. Well, so, he's, someone, he's someone from what I can tell that uh, is is he needs the approval. I, uh, and you are being a, a valedictorian, and uh, uh, it, it it shows the way the way that uh, the school system here in the U.S. at least uh, is totally ass back. But my mom, who was just functionally smart, very smart actually, in a functionally way, back in the 1930s, she she got into college by the age she was 16. She got out of, she did college in two years and by 19, she had completed business school. And then she was out in the 1930s being a working woman, working as an accountant and a bookkeeper. Now I, for example, I could have graduated even just trying half-heartedly in my public school years, I could have graduated a year and a half early if they had had uh, where they could would graduate if you got enough stuff. I mean, I just breezed through it and uh, that's how I fell in with, with the gang too. Uh, is that I was bored and I had to go to this this school and just hang around because I, I, I could cut classes and I could pass the test easily. Uh, and I there was no reward for someone who could do that. Now, uh, not, not that that's, you know, I mean, what they should have done is, you know, they, they you should be able to rapid advance kids and, and, and push them. The, but the, the focus of the American system is on the bottom, not the top. And because they do that, if you look at if you look at someone like this Christopher Langan, he seemed like a very emotionally needy and fucked up person from all the stuff. Uh, there was a four hour interview. You only have the half hour Errol Morris one you want to look at. Yeah, but I, 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 I looked at the, that one as well. Yeah. Yeah, the four-hour one where some Asian kid is just basically fawning all over him, even though he's speaking in the same nonsensical way that mm -hmm. Jordan Peterson does. It's more intellectualized. Uh, but if you look at his writing with that CTMU, uh, it's very Ayn Rand. It, 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 it's, it's leaden. It, that there's no, and even the way he speaks, there's no sense of a real personality there other than there's that little coiled up little boy inside of him that's resentful. And it's very much like Peterson's. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's funny. You mentioned that interview. The interview begins uh, like this is literally how it starts. Uh, the guy interviewing him says uh, the, the, first, the opening question is literally. So, Chris, in your experience, 
how long does it take the average person to understand your CTMU? That's like, that's, that's literally the, the opening question as if that would even matter as if like, you know, uh, like not even like let's assess whether or not it's worth understanding for whatever duration of time you would invest in it. Um, it's, you know, it, it's all about the outside. It's other people, other people, like who cares? Right. And, and this is the thing that I'm getting at. Like, you know, I never want to be someone that, you know, uh, like cares about like, you know, like, like, oh, you know, like I, I, I did well in college. Like I had, you know, like good grades or whatever. Like I always like, I'm always thinking like the next book, like what is the next thing I'm going to write? What is the next essay going to look like? The only, the only thing you have is actual accomplishments. Right. And when you look at people like Chris or others that, you know, like you said, like this coiled up little boy, I always have, I, I'm, I'm always aware that I have that potential inside me to like re- regress back to that coiled up little boy, right? Being needy when I was young, dealing with all kinds of garbage when I was young. You could easily regress into that. The only way that you could avoid that is you cannot look at what other people tell you. You cannot, um, you know, uh, try to get things from society, right? Like a, a pat on the head. You always have to do things your own way and you cannot, you, know, you cannot depend on these kinds of tests. It's just bullshit. <laughs> If you read that CTMU, and I read the first 40 or 50 pages and then just got bored but with the terrible writing, it's basically a d- justification for God. Even he, he calls God, he uses the acronym grand something with an O determiner yeah. or something of the universe. Yeah. Uh, and he, it, it, it's just so silly. And I, I, the way he describes it, and you know, I've written True Life, and you said you wanted to do some shows on the True Life stuff, and uh, even though that's like now 18 years since I wrote it. But the thing is, you know, if you look on my eCosmoetica website, I have a video. It's, uh, it's actually the tape recording, uh, an audio tape recording of me on Christmas of 1972 with my mom, my dad, and my sister. And I told you, and, and I'm not, I'm not trying to dick wave in this way against the Langan, but but my guess is that Chris Langan and being bullied for being big or, or whatnot, he didn't. Pro- he probably didn't have as bad a life as I did growing up. Yet, if you listen to that. If you listen to that 1972 Christmas at the Schneider's video and just listen to the audio, I, I, I sometimes look at it and I'm like, God, I was in a Boolean kid. Nothing could get me down. Uh, you know, th- this is this is when literally the same within a year or so that I first started saw it, probably by that time I'd seen two or three people murdered. I had been I I had been deemed the smart little kid by the local gangsters who need, needed deliveries of this, that, or the other thing. I was doing all that. I, I too was bullied by a kid named Diddy and his brother <laughs> Rough Rider. Uh, there was all this, time. and yet you listen to that, and I mean, granted, you go through ups and downs, but here I am on Christmas Day. I got a tape recorder. This, this was, this was, this was my, this was the thing that satisfied me. I asked for a tape recorder. And I'm, I'm pretending like I'm interviewing my, my parents like a man on the street, but I'm so bullied. And when I when I first found that and, and put that online, I, I listened to it. I was like, boy, this really goes against, against you know, people would be like, oh, he must have grown up wealthy or something because he sounds so he sounds so happy and well adjusted there. Mm-hmm. But that goes to show you, though, that that uh, you can overcome certain things. And one of the things with this this Langan. Even if we accept that he has a 200 or so IQ, uh, there's something uh, I don't believe in emotional intelligence to the degree that a lot of people do. I think there is emotional intelligence, but my God, there's such a like I said, this resent this resentment that is so obvious in those videos we just did of of Peterson. Uh, and if we listen to that, you just look at the man's body posture. You know, he, he's like, yeah, motherfucker, yeah, mother. And in that, in that 30 minutes with the Morris video, I mean, he's back and forth between being the coiled up little boy who, who's being picked on and, and, and the bully himself that, that wants to basically say to the world that I'm, I'm the best. You know, I could just imagine him being uh, what, 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 1984, what do they call the, the head leader in the book? I forget what they call him, but I, I could just imagine him b- being one of those fascist leaders. You know, he wants a bust like Mussolini. Well, well, he, he sort of, uh, admits that in the Morris video, like indirectly, right? I mean, like de facto, he's going to be the one, 
of this like high IQ super species that is calling the shots in terms of who gets to reproduce and who doesn't. Right. Yeah. I assume he's going to have a, 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 you know, harem of women that are just, you know, sucking him off and riding him and producing babies. Like I assume that that's really what, what kind of drives him. So, I mean, let's just go through this uh, yeah. video. And this is the thing with the, like the eugenics too. I'm, yeah. I've often said with people that there's good eugenics and bad eugenics. If you, if, if, in 50 years, they're able to genetically weed out uh, the causes of dwarfism. That's a good idea. And I always use the dwarf thing because I knew a family of dwarves. And I knew how the two boys there suffered uh, there. Uh, that's a good thing. Uh, but he is certainly advocating the very thing that makes people think eugenics is 100% bad. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, I'm not sure to what degree he, he understands this. Like, it also seems like he's not... He yeah, he's not, he's, he doesn't seem like, again, like going back to like, you know, I don't want, I don't want to, you know, make it sound like I'm picking on him, but again, like he is presenting himself like, uh, to society and it does seem like there's like a lot of stuff emotionally going on again. Like I still can't get over when he says that there's this IQ test running around and he uh, like lying around. And he's like, I'm very curious about this. I have never fucking taken an IQ test and I would never care to, right. To the extent that I've taken tests, it was always to get something out of it. And I, you know, I just want to forget it at this point, but again, you know, again, that, again, it gets down to accomplishment just today and probably by tomorrow, uh, I'll finish uh, another play that I'm doing a play about, about the Vikings encountering the Native American Mi'kmaq people of the Maritime Provinces. And it's told from the, their point of view, the Mi'kmaqs, and the Vikings are, are seen as the savages and they're, they're, they're scorned by the Native American. And it's an interesting reversal. But even in that just one play, I you know, there's more intellectual heft than in all of what this guy has done in a fucking uh, career. But this society says, oh, he scored 200, 210 on some time that that's better than an accomplishment it's such it's so it's so reductive and it's it's one of the reasons that silas and and, and society hasn't progressed is because they value the wrong things they value money they value the, these these markers that that a small elite group that doesn't even realize that 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 what they're propounding in an iq test do, doesn't doesn't predict the uh, accomplishment just like like you know one of the things that makes Beethoven or Mozart so remarkable is they were prodigies, but but they kept it up. The vast majority of child prodigies, the only thing that a child prodigy does is they have uh, an adult intellect young. Most of them never go beyond that. So by the time everyone else is at 35, they caught up with the prodigy. Yeah. But um, anyway, let's... <laughs> yeah. And one more point that I want to make about this, like more broadly, is uh, you know, like uh, you and I would both agree that the world is clearly not a a meritocracy, right? And because there is though some like quantifiable means to like measure like IQ or whatever, that gives people like Langan, you know, this kind of niche and opportunity to recruit people into their like little pet projects, right? Because they could say, well, look, yes, we're all agreeing. The world is not a meritocracy, but here, look at my accomplishment, right? Look at my high IQ. I can be the one that calls the shots, sign on to my project, right? And I'll, and I'll show you the way. I'll show you the truth, as Peterson says, right? And his kind of like guruship. So but before, this you, before you started, just, I was just looking up to see what the CTMU actually stood for. So I just Googled, it said, cognitive theoretical model of the universe. Now, if there's a CTMU wiki, I'm, I'm, I'm sure he's behind that or his fans are. And he even said, the CTMU pronounced cat mew. <laughs> now, now, I'm sure that that is probably what Langan uh, refers to it. Uh, and, and he thinks that's probably uh, a creative. And I, I literally just didn't see, see that until 90 seconds ago. And yeah. I, I, I would bet, I would bet most of my my minimal wealth that that he Langan uh, instead of saying Kit Mew or Kit Moo he said Cat Mew because it's cute probably to impress his wife or something who's another woman who has I guess a high IQ. Yeah, high IQ and also a very we'll get into their kind of like personal beliefs about things that have become like really uh, uh, odd and like very um, malignant as well, right? To the extent that they're on social media. But anyway, this is the er Errol Morris, a documentary from like, I believe 1999. Yeah. Uh, he, he did a bunch of profiles and one of the profiles was Christopher Langan.
you seeing me right now through that monitor in front of you? The answer is yes or no, and if you can't choose, you can't perceive me. You don't know whether I'm here or not. Sounds like a rapper. (laughs) Yeah. Yes or no. Binary logic is something you depend on. Dog. Without it, you can't have so much as a single perception. If we can base insight to God on binary logic, we've got it made. We don't need faith anymore. It's extraneous, irrelevant. Yeah. So you mentioned earlier how um, you know he's he's just justifying God. He he is, I think, in some ways like a like a Christian fundamentalist, right? You see some of his uh, other writings or some of his like posts on social media. It does seem like he has this kind of like uh, craving to not just like prove the existence of God, but specifically uh, he, he wants like there to be, you know, some kind of like almost like a Christian conce- conception of God. Right. And, well, and the Christian conception of God is truth. And he says later in this video, I'm the first man to ever, I'm closer to absolute truth than any human being has ever been. Yeah. I am closer to to absolute truth than any man has been before (laughs) me. Do I think that makes me better than everybody else? No. You're damn straight. I still work in a bar. I I wonder wonder why he titled that. I guess the smartest man he was, I guess, giving the... Marilyn Vos Savant her due because she she has a 220 or 226 I IQ so I get I guess yeah. I guess he was giving her the props but anyway I mean it's also kind of like I, I think Errol Morris is kind of being a little bit uh, sarcastic here right with some yeah, of the kind I, of like yeah. like you like you listen to the music right this kind of triumphant yeah. music plays as he says totally insane shit you know throughout you the can, video you can see slave girls behind him just throwing pedals yeah, or or this like you know this like subtitle Darwin in the toilet, right? Which is gonna be like more consequential when we get to his like CTMU a little bit. Working construction during the day, and I was working in a bar at night, and I happened to see a copy of Omni magazine. It said the world's most difficult IQ test it consists of forty-eight problems, some of which are extremely difficult. I think, gee, that's interesting. Like you, like I'm sure Dan, you would not find that interesting. Like that, that's the uh, thing. Like I, I it's just I. magazine. It was one of the few good things that Bob Guccione did, I think. Uh, yeah, but, but 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 like you know, like it's this this like fascination with like I want to now measure my IQ. It's just it, it it's just very you know like, again like I, I don't want to be too harsh here because you know when I, the younger me would also be fascinated it would also be like fuck it like if I you know could do this in the SATs let's see how other ways I could dick wave right. Well, you know um, you know. It's- it's interesting because I mentioned that video I did from 72 Christmas where I was interviewing my parents. When I think of it, I've always been far more interested in the world world outside of me rather than myself. Yeah. I've always yeah, taken exactly. for granted that I'm, I'm, I'm a smart kid or a smart man or whatnot. He, th- th- this suggests, you know, it, it, it's, it, he's, the, he's the, the plug hole and things have to revolve around him. And, and it's it's like we just watch how he lights up. This is literally the happiest that he's in the entire video. Just watch his face. It's just of yeah. forty eight problems, some of which are extremely difficult. I think, gee, that's interesting. <laughs> it's the happiest I've ever seen you know, him. That, that's interesting. <laughs> I always wanted to know what my IQ was. The verbal problems were all pretty easy, so I just breezed through them. I happen to have a larger than average vocabulary. The really difficult ones were some of the spatial problems and the number sequences. Actually, highly difficult. So, uh, as it turned out, I ended up setting a record score on that test. The Guinness Book was actually going to switch the world's highest IQ title to me, but then they dropped the highest IQ listing. IQ is not really a PC concept anymore, and I guess the Guinness Book fell victim to PC. And it's it's odd that he takes his tactic, right? Uh, the real reason why Guinness uh, dropped a highest IQ score from its uh, rankings is because 
it's very subjective. Like there is no such thing as the official, you know, recognized IQ test that will definitively tell you what your true IQ score is, right? There's like the test that he took. There's a bunch of like online tests. There's tests that you could take that are different from various, you know, a psychologist's uh, offices, right? They're, they're like, how would you standardize this? Like there would have to be something, right? And not everybody would have access to the same people, the same test. This is probably why they got rid of it. it I don't think it's just PC. And also at the time, as I said, Marilyn Vos Savant was was recognized, uh, and she's a woman, and I believe she's Jewish, so. Yeah. My IQ would be somewhere between 190 and 210. 210 seems very, very, very high. The camera moves away from him. Albert Einstein was estimated at between 180 and 190. Charles Darwin is way down there in the toilet at 135. It's like, like, it's like, he's so envious of the fact that Darwin accomplished something, right? It's just incredible. Like, and, like, and, and like, you read his, um, you know, the CTMU where he says stuff like, "There's a radical Darwinian notion." He, to him, to him, Darwin's natural selection is a radical form of natural selection that he wants nothing to do with, right? And he just can't stand the fact that Darwin who, you know, he, he, he changed scientific history in many ways. And he also wrote, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, Origins of Species is a well-written book, right? Langan, although he uh, postures as someone that truly, truly understands language, he says this all the time. He says that scientists are poor communicators. He's worse than the baseline scientist as a communicator. Um, and, you know, this is, this is, I think this obvious envy. Yes. And just so you know, Vos Savant, I was just looking up, She's not Jewish. I, I was just, I, I wasn't trying to impute anything, but uh, she's not Jewish. She was born in 1946, and her, she, she did hold in the 1990s, uh, 228, the Stanford mm -hmm. Binet uh, test, which is, uh, which uh, is a different one that he supposedly took. But uh, so just to get things correct there. Yeah. So, like in this kind of you know eugenics hierarchy. Right, he would have to be licking her boot as she yeah. uh, pegs him with a dildo. <laughs> Are you a genius? Well, you're kind of putting me on the spot here, aren't you? Yeah. I mean, yeah, you're you're for you're forcing me to either say no, in which case you know it's all hype, or you're forcing me to say yes. I'll, I'll say probably yes. I am a genius by most of the criteria, the definitive criteria of genius. I think you'd have to consider me a genius. Yeah. At the age of six or seven months, I started pointing at objects and giving their correct names. A little red pair of shoes with, uh, with little brass buckles on them that I really loved. And I thought that buckle was a beautiful word, so I pointed to the buckle on one of these shoes and said, Buckle? Shortly thereafter, I started talking in sentences. I seemed to have an understanding of syntax, and uh, so I was a very early talker. I heard my mother talking about this little girl. Becky already knew how to read. I thought, well, I'm certainly not going to be beaten by her. She didn't seem especially intelligent to me, and I just knew I could out-accelerate her. Like, it's just a, such early ego, right? And again, like, a lot of kids are like this. I was sort of like this, too. Like, but, like, he, he has never shook this from his psyche, right? He's still driven by the same stuff. Well, I remember, too, when I was a kid, my friend Mark Taylor, who uh, I interviewed on the Ecosmoetica channel, is, uh, he was the first kid in kindergarten to know how to read. But by second grade, I remember he was having some personal issues in his family. And I remember I whizzed through a box of books where you'd read a three or four paragraph story and answer questions. I, I got about 50 percent ahead. But, but you know, I, I just don't see that as my life's greatest accomplishment now. Yeah. Yeah. For uh, three or four, I started writing a book. It's an illustrated volume on snakes, lizards, and turtles. I had this, just this knowledge, this, this utter knowledge that someday I would do something qualified me as being a genius. They keep showing him I looking stoically off into the ether uh, as yeah. if that's supposed to... I, 
bizarre. So I skipped a few grades. Everybody would look at me and say, well, this kid must be smarter, otherwise he wouldn't be so much younger than we are. By the same token, he's weaker than we are, so why don't we pick on him a little, you know? Kids don't like other kids around them that are praised for being smarter than they are. Why can't you be more like that kid? That kid is so much smarter than you are. Look at that kid's work, so much better than yours is. I mean, that's got to be an unpleasant thing. We were always the poorest family in town. All kinds of welts on our bodies and fat lips. Kids are like sharks. They made the mistake of thinking these welts and things were signs of me being weaker than they were. <laughs> they rapidly found out that wasn't the case. My actual father had died. This was only one of the bad breaks that my mother got in the man department. They had a habit of dying or disappearing. The only one that really hung around, which was my stepfather, turned out to be a total psychopath. Just a mean and brutal guy, that's all. Four but four. Yeah, we're we're bastard. getting uh, a little uh, foreshadowing of what we're going to talk about yep. later. But. <laughs> Jack did not like to be in the presence of anyone more intelligent than he was. I saw him put on this pair of leather gloves. I've noticed you're a pretty smart kid, he said. You probably know how many miles it is to the sun, don't you? And I said, yes, as a matter of fact, I do know how many miles it is to the sun. It's, you know, between 92 and 93 million miles. Kablam, right in the mouth. The reason he put on the gloves was that he wouldn't skin his knuckles. In this world, if you pretend to be too much smarter than other people, you're going to get into trouble for that. He was going to be the vehicle of my enlightenment. <laughs> we got a horse. The horse's name was Whitco. If the fence wasn't high enough, and they were never high enough, this horse would just get away. So he entrusted me with making sure that the horse did not escape. The first time the horse got away, you know, the old man beat the crap out of me, just like I knew he would. Next, he went down and got himself a heavy galvanized dog chain and a couple of padlocks. Puts one end of the dog chain around the horse's neck and padlocks it. And he says, come here. And I went over there and he put the other end around my waist and he padlocked that. And he drives off. It was only a matter of time. The horse naturally went through the barbed wire fence, and it dragged me up a dirt street and part of the way down Main Street before the chain broke. I was covered with blood, blood in my eyes, you know, I was like, went from my eyes now. Finally, I managed to get home, and I'm walking up the front steps, and all of a sudden, cut, bam! I find myself flat on my back. I couldn't breathe. And I was going, <gasps> There's the old man standing over me and says, I told you not to let that blanket horse get away. <laughs> Until finally, when I was 14, I just booted his ass out. Beat him half to death and told him that if he ever came back, that was going to be the end of him. I found they the named the horse, horse of... Lakota for horses is Whitco. I was just looking it up because I knew from my a, a poem I did, Tashunka Whitco was Crazy Horse's uh, mm -hmm. Lakota name. So he, the, the, father, the stepfather named the horse Horse, basically, in Lakota. Mm -hmm. <laughs> School to be highly annoying. I think I could have wrapped the whole thing up in a couple of years. Instead, they managed to keep me around for 12. <laughs> I spent most of the last two years sitting in the library. I just had had it. I told them I was tired of it and wasn't going to take it anymore. Wasn't going to be showing up unless they made some special provision for me. And when I wasn't in the library, I wasn't there at all. My teachers just didn't particularly care for me. Here's a kid. He's ragged. He looks mangy and hungry. He's known for getting into fights. The rule was... Either total indifference or outright hostility. It would have been nice if somebody had said, we've been keeping this kid down too long. Let's send him away to college or university, but nobody gave enough of a hoot to bother doing that. So that's it. Maybe by that point, they thought I was too far gone. <laughs> Maybe they were right. You know, and he does have, you know, like legitimate points that he's making here, right? Um, yeah. it's, it's, it's just, just like that. Said, yeah, yeah it's, it's just that to what extent do these experiences breed all of this uh, uh resentment that you know like maybe he, he maybe he could have accomplished something on some other in some other kind of context right like, I, I mean it's, it's perfectly possible who knows 
Oh, this is wonderful. I wasn't invited yeah. to my graduation. My head was too large to be fitted for a cap. The cranial circumference was too great. Couldn't buy a motorcycle helmet either. So you More had a large <laughs> head. Yes. Near as I can determine, it's about six standard deviations above the norm. The odds against having a head the size of mine are millions to one. Brainiac. The odds of having an intelligence such as yours? Also, millions to one, but we can't necessarily infer from that that there's a correlation. We'd have to have more cases of big-headed, intelligent people. My own personal opinion is, yes, head size does influence intelligence. So I my my own personal opinion. You know, this reminds me of uh, it's that uh, Simpsons episode where Homer is told that he has an exceedingly like thick head. Uh, <laughs> so therefore, he starts getting involved in all these like boxing fights where all he has to do is just wait for the boxer to tire out after beating him in the head, and then he could just like knock out the boxer with one hit. Um, Size does matter. It, it has to. Size does matter. I mean, if you take a very small creature with a very small head, you're never going to see a lot of intelligence out of it. Take a centipede. How smart are they? Not very smart. On the other hand, take a house cat. Well, that's somewhat smarter. Take a larger-headed creature, a monkey, even smarter than a house cat. Now take a really large-brained creature like a man. Smarter still. What he misses right here, though, is, uh, and you mentioned it in, in your notes, is uh, the, the folding of, of this the cerebrum is more important than the size because it's 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 the area uh, that it covers. So you can have you could have, for example, uh, two people with similar sized heads. One, you know, and you can even go from Homo sapiens to Homo neanderthalus, uh, neanderthalensis. You get a neanderthal and a, a regular guy. We do have more folds. Uh, it's true that the, the neanderthals had bigger brains, but they didn't have quite the fold than we did. Now. Uh, so there, there's so much about brains that even now we don't understand. This is just a lot of, uh, this is perfect kind of silism here. The, the simple yeah. biggest is better. Yeah. And also, I mean, like, you know, there's a, obviously uh, men's brains are larger than women's brains simply because our bodies are larger. Right. Um, uh, and, but like, like, e even if you, if you, even if you want to make arguments about uh, like head size and brain size and stuff like that, uh, the metric that you know scientists use if they if they go down that route is it, it's in a relative sense, right? It's not he, like he's trying to make this kind of absolute argument that look, oh, centipede versus house cat. The real metric that has like more value that you could like recreate again and again is one where you compare body mass to brain size in a relative way. Because based on what he's saying, you should expect that a sperm whale is smarter than a human being. Obviously, that's not true. It doesn't matter that it has a larger brain, right? Yeah, well, and it's also too that we have opposable digits and we also have, an, uh, we have digits and we have an opposable thumb. Even an elephant doesn't have that. I mean, we have the most, I mean, the very fact that we have an opposable thumb allows precision grip, power grip, which no other animal, even 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 bonobos and chimps, uh, have a very crude power grip and precision grip. And so it's the little things like that. It's not just the brain; it's what the tools that evolve alongside the brain. Because yeah, it's yeah, exactly. Way. There's that. Yeah, there's a feedback loop there. Like for you know, yeah. for you to have that kind of intelligence, if you're able to, in complex ways, deal with tools, that obviously is going to have an effect in the ways that your brain develops. If you end up creating, you know, these highly social groups that human yeah. beings create, you know, right now I think the dominant theory is human intelligent evolve intelligence evolved explicitly because of our groupings, explicitly because human beings were able to start uh, forming alliances or tricking one another in ways that you know other animals could do in s smaller ways but not in the way that people can right which which allowed this hyper development and this is um and this is like a foreshadowing of what he would say like i think in the last few years he made some kind of comment like um coco the gorilla had a higher iq than like some somalians you know like some well, that, like, and, like and completely and, yeah and, exactly and completely you can you can you i actually just two or three weeks ago watched a video online just from two or three years ago uh where they totally debunked a lot of what the coco was saying uh, there's a there's a video of coco the gorilla 
two weeks before she died or something, supposedly talking about or the global warming or something. And it totally exposed the, 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 the bullshit nature of, of the ability of, of uh, our closest uh, primate relatives uh, having language like us. They, uh, number one, uh, they, uh, they also lack the larynx, the voice box we have. But even those that, that have signs, they are very, it, 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 they don't speak the same way to, uh, if they're videotaped to, if they have one of their uh, handlers with them to some other person. So if I was in there and the, the, and Coco was signing to me, it would be gibberish. Yeah. yeah. You know, anyway. It's, 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 it's kind of odd, right? Because like, okay, so here's a guy that is very emphatic about his knowledge of, of, of language, communication, that kind of thing. Like the fact is, if you really understood the implications of language, you would know for a fact that if there's anybody on the planet that you could take that is able to speak a human language, which, you know, even like a, a Somalian with low IQ would be able to fluently speak a human language. If that is in fact the case, that person will always, by definition, be smarter than any other animal on the planet. There's no way to get around that fact, right? Um, but, it, you know, it's like, it's like like basic stuff like that that he doesn't really get, right? He's, he's always losing so many, like, big picture. Like, he makes a lot of, like, small mistakes all the time, but he's always, like, losing, like, big picture uh, stuff, uh, especially. There is some kind of Which makes him very much like Ayn Rand. Yeah. What would be the volume of your brain? Don't know, I haven't actually done it. I could do it by volumetric displacement using the Archimedean method of submerging my head in a tub of water, <laughs> seeing how much water. It would be smaller than the average Neanderthal. Like, why isn't he gluing about that? You know, like, does it matter? Like, does it matter? Throwing around. Look, look, at, look at the way he uses the volumetric displacement, you know? Uh, yeah. he, he always has to, you know, I've always found when people do what I call big word throwing arounding, uh, they generally don't even know what half the words mean, and they certainly don't know how to contextualize them to put them in a sentence that is possible or even enjoyable in any kind of aesthetic way. But anyway, and and also like when when I first heard this, I didn't even know what he was talking about because okay, let's assume that you that you would put your head into this bowl of water and you you know you engage in this volumetric displacement. That's going to give you the mass for your entire head. That doesn't necessarily say that your brain is like he could have for all we know, an especially thick skeleton, right? Like we don't know that. Like you, you can't get the actual volume of the brain simply, simply based on something like this. You would get a total, you know, you you would basically get like you know the total mass of the head. But that's and, and, how we saw it. You know, I, I think you were right early when you said that the uh, uh, Morris was basically trolling him. Because no head could fit into those bowls. They're basically dog bowls. You'd have to have like one of those things where you go bobbing for apples and you can. Yeah. Could... <laughs> yeah. It is displaced by doing that. But so I, I don't think Langan is even cl clear that he's being made fun of in a certain way here. Yeah. I show up at Reed College, which was at the time one of the top liberal arts institutions in the country, very exclusive. They had a different style in the classroom than I was used to couldn't get a word in edgewise. I mean, these kids were constantly talking, asking questions, and that's a healthy way to learn. I mean, I don't hold it against them. It's just that it was a lot of culture shock. Also, the marijuana. I mean, I wasn't used to the drug use that it was all around. They crammed me in a room with three other guys, banging their girlfriends on the bunk above me in the other room. There were some other things, too, that had gone wrong. My roommates had become involved in some kind of riot or demonstration cars were turned over and burned. They were insisting that I should have been expelled despite the fact that I had nothing to do with this incident. I was in the library. And they never even called me. No one wanted to talk to me to ask whether I had been there. Maybe that's one of the reasons nobody came to me and said, hey, where's your parents' financial statement? This is an easy way to get rid of him. We just, you know, won't make any waves and hope that he doesn't get that statement in on time. This is like, you know, it's kind of like one of those, um, you know, things in a bad movie that you would see, like, you know, the the the, the slow formation of like an arch villain of some sort, right? Yeah, I was thinking um, the exact same thing when I'm writing. It's like the, these little, uh, uh, and I just seeing this and having watched the whole thing just yesterday before for the show, I was thinking how, you know, one of the reasons I wrote my true life uh, was there was that idiot who wrote that book, Running with Scissors. 
these people mm-hmm. who who bit, and I'm not certainly he I'm, I'm sure he's correct when he says he was one of the poorest people in in his town or whatnot. But even being growing up in small town Wyoming poor is going to be vastly better than growing up in uh, a big city like New York and being poor or in anywhere else around the world. And and yet he these slights that he's talking about. Uh, are so trivial. Yeah. Uh, if you are really are that intelligent and so grand, why is this fucking still within you? I mean, you know, I, I think of Lauren Isley. Lauren Isley, a great accomplishment, probably the best science writer of the well in English language ever, I would say. And if you read his autobiography, his autobiography, uh, what was it called? Um, all the strange hours. Right. All the strange hours. You read that. It's wonderfully written. It's a great accomplishment, just literarily. Uh, it's one of the best four or five memoirs ever written. Yet he went through the same kind of stuff. He didn't come with a, a, a silver spoon in his mouth. He, he was playing around in, in the underground of, of his Nebraska town. And yet he did things. And he, he, he was outward looking. This, he, he's, in a sense, the anti-Isley in that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So once I found this out, I simply left. I didn't take my finals or anything like that. Academia stinks, and it's not always the student's fault when something like that happens. Academia is a heartless, cold bureaucracy. I had to hold a bag of plasma for a guy who had 11 pieces of double odd buck embedded in him. He was shot through a door with a 12 gauge shotgun. I've been shot at on numerous occasions. I've seen a lot of guys stabbed with knives. I've seen people throw each other off 20 or 30 foot balconies. I've seen people stab each other with sticks. And I was just there to try to prevent the situation from getting any worse than it had to be. Bar bouncing, being a security guy in nightclubs. It was a Ramada Inn in Bozeman, Montana, where you have a lot of cowboys and shit kickers. Cowboys get drunk, start fights, and try to put the make on each other's women. That's essentially their lifestyle. That's <laughs> like what what I find that so odd. Like what a what a thing to say. That's the cowboy lifestyle. Very odd, I must say. That's what a cowboy does. Well, this came out before uh, Brokeback Mountain, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there were a few incidents that I helped out with. The bar owner decided it might be a good thing to have me around there every night and to pay me police fall into being policemen for roughly the same reason. Psychologically, they're just in that mode. I want to apply authority to other people. I want to apply it forcefully if need be. I'm not really doing anything differently than than they are, except I'm taking a lot more risks for a lot less money and fewer benefits. You've got to concentrate on what you're doing when you're breaking up a fight, but the rest of the time, my mind is usually someplace else off in another world, a mental world, my own private space. Despite the fact that very loud music is playing, I've actually had some very good ideas while I'm bouncing. I used to carry around a little pad and a pencil. One thing that I noticed was if I had some complex stuff in memory and a bar fight happened and I had to go indulge in some physical violence, that usually my memory was erased when I get done with the fight. I mean, it would be gone, irretrievable. One time I was thinking about artificial intelligence, then that evolved into a whole new way of looking at neural networks. Suddenly this horrible fight erupted. I set the page down and I mopped up the fight and I came back over and my piece of paper was gone. I tried and tried and tried to find that piece of paper nobody could tell me where it was and i couldn't remember what the hell i'd written on it it's very convenient right the one thing that he could have invented in his life that would have been an actual accomplishment he just happens to have forgotten right and the Um, thing is that's that's something that the the, there have been many people who have had that eureka moment supposedly and they said something got in the way now i'm not saying that it couldn't be true but the thing is that's He's indulging right there in a cliche. And if you listen to this, uh, it's not quite as uh, seven or eight cliches per minute as the Peterson videos, 
But you know, I, I, I'm the poor kid who who who, who uh, everyone picked on. Uh, he 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 has this very cliched narrative. Um, you know, when I think of of my life, one of the things I think. God, I have such a, a, a an interesting, unique life, and I look at it as an asset. He's he's so, someone who it reminds me. I've told you, I won't name. I it, it reminds me of this woman that I was once involved with many years ago that I, I mentioned, who's now become a new age scam artist. Um, and she she had something happen to her, and it, it uh, she uh, uh, uses the exact same tropes and stuff that a thousand other people have had the same thing happen to her. To, to them have said before he, he there's nothing unique about anything in his life to this point except and this, this is why he makes it except except that he sky scored so high on this iq test that's the only thing that supposedly makes him unique but why do you want to be in an environment where there's violence. What makes you think that I want to be in these environments? Did I say that I wanted to be in these environments? I fell into this line of work. Uh, in order to get out of a line of work, you've got to get into something else. Well, I did. I got into construction. I, I, I was a Forest Service firefighter for a long time. These things take a toll on you. I have a trick knee now. My lower back went on me. Do hard labor for 20 or 25 years, and it's going to take its toll. And, you know, this is something that obviously most people don't understand, right? This is where poten potentially he could have something to contribute, right? But he's choosing to focus on something else entirely, right? Finally, yeah. you're grateful for the chance to have a job where you just stand there and watch most of the time. And most people don't get that, right? They don't get this part. If I can ever get out of it, then I will be happy to do so. I would love it. I don't think we should live in a violent world. I think that everybody should be wonderful and kind to each other. But let's face facts, shall we? Very few people More are- More Jordan Peterson level. Uh, yeah. It's not the kind of world we live in yet. If I have anything to say about it, it will be the kind of world we live in someday. Right? It, it, Boom! It, it, I, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm going back to the Woody Allen book from where he makes Alan Old out to be Mussolini. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and also, just like you know, Jordan Peterson, when he says things like, Who's going to make that determination, right? Who gets what, right? Well, you get the sense again and again through Peterson that Peterson believes he ought to make that determination to the extent that he believes that no one should touch, you know, the status quo in any way. He's already making that determination. Now I have another, another guy who, and, and this is another thing, right? Like um, I have never wanted to be in like positions of authority, like positions of like, you know, kind of like, I guess, more stereotypical forms of leadership. I want to be away from people. I want to like sit down. I want to like write books. I want to be left alone. I want to walk down the street where nobody recognizes me. And he says again and again that he wants to essentially be this overseer over humanity, right? And again, like if that's not a clue to his actual motivations, like I, I don't know what is, right? Yeah. This is a feeding frenzy we're in here. Everybody is trying to wring as much out of this planet as they possibly can. Pollution, overpopulation, militarism on the parts of foreign governments. Militarism on the parts of foreign governments. Like what, what, what your own government isn't doing uh, the you know majority of what you're talking about right now. And this is the other thing. Like he has this like weird, you know, like the Mussolini comparison. Like he has this kind of like like odd, you know, uh, um, reactionary nationalistic streak. Right. He's very much a jingoist as well. You know, Christian fundamentalist in some ways, jingoist in other ways poverty problems we've got a lot of people starving to death diseases out there on the horizon that need to be cured and now he's an anti-vaxxer right diseases on the horizon that need to be cured 2022 anti-vaxxer you look, you, look you look at this imagery here and again this is a morris doing it but the way he talks it's, it reminds me of a lot of writers who are bad writers who who will on their back cover blurbs they'll say well, so and so deals with you know uh, uh, diseases, uh, 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 political unrest, uh, this that all these things he mentioned, but 
the way they deal with it is that they just mention it like this. If he's so goddamn smart, uh, forget the CTMU. Why don't you uh, develop a way for more equal distribution? Why don't you support UBI? The smartest man in the world says UBI will work. Yeah. You know? well, well, here's the well, here's the thing. He says the following. Well, first of all, he's not able to accomplish any of that because it takes actual achievement. So instead, he wastes his time with the CTMU, and he says that is going to be the key to unlock all these positive things that you just mentioned. Right? He has a perfect like system worked out where he gets to have absolutely everything by doing absolutely nothing. Forms of pollution we couldn't even have imagined a century ago, including radioactive waste. The sea is becoming a desert. We're running out of farmland. We're losing the ozone layer. Polar ice caps are melting. We have a lot of problems now. How do we do what's right? How do we fulfill our destiny here on planet Earth and beyond? Destiny. Colleges and universities purport to be harnessing intelligence for the good of Things mankind. Come. They're a breeding house for parrots. People are allowed to make little tentative moves forward, but they're not really allowed to do anything too radical. What does Agony Illuminati claim? And, and you know, he, again, like he's he's he is unlike Peterson. Peterson could go for a whole fucking video and say nothing at all that's true. He's saying you know some things here that are legitimately true, right? Yeah. To have a solution to the ills of the world. As soon as you announce that you have a little bit of money to spend, virtually every hand, and there will be a lot of hands that reach out for that money, will belong to a professional academic. They're hogging all the resources that should go to solving these problems. We need an alternative to academia. It's not the, the capitalist. alternative to academia is the ultra-high IQ community. Right, like, just think about that. We need an alternative to academia. I think there's, there's something to that, uh, but his solution is what? The high IQ community. It's just, you know, this is this is something you could put until it, yeah, it definitely could be a line from a Woody Allen movie, definitely. Smart people are vastly outnumbered by average people. It's the nature of the bell curve. <laughs> so in any kind of democratic society, average people are going to end up calling the shots at the very top of our economic and socio-political structure are dunces. El stupido. People who don't have a clue. When you turn a bunch of dunces <laughs> this is such loose, funny it's imagery. To happen. Dunsical <laughs> equilibrium. These are the elites, the monkeys. Mediocrity has triumphed. Everywhere you look, you see signs of mediocrity. I mean, chips, actually. <laughs> yeah, chips. The stupid person thinks that he's as smart or smarter than the smart person. And therein lies Dunning the stupidity. Cougar. Yeah. Which is him. Them call themselves exactly. CEOs. And he's also right, right? He says these people call themselves CEOs. Absolutely true, right? Yeah. The, 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 again, but again, the issue is the resentments that he's accumulated, they're going in the wrong direction. He could isolate some correct problems and then completely go off the deep end um, right. because he's not, you know, he hasn't gotten over his own issues. Now, but and the thing is, he blames academia. I'm not a fan of academia, as everyone knows, but he blames academia. But academia is where he w feels that he could make it with his his IQ, and he's been ex excluded. Uh, the CEOs, th he, he, it seems more like lip service than uh, that. You you get this. He's more animated talking about academia, uh, and. And, you know, I'm against political correctness. I don't like a lot of the stuff. In some ways, Jordan Peterson makes some valid points about academia, but they don't control the purse strings. Yeah, exactly. You have to learn how to kiss up, kiss your way up the ladder of success. Also true. How do you change that balance of power? I think it has to be changed at the individual level. We have to reshape the image of what it means to be a human being. We have to create a new kind of person. Jordan Peterson, Oprah stuff. Exactly. I was just you thinking that. can't run a democracy with a citizenry that really doesn't know how to make valid decisions. Most people don't even know what decision theory is. They don't know what maximization of utility is. We live in a highly complex technological world and it's not entirely obvious what's right and what's wrong in any given situation unless you can parse the situation, deconstruct it. People just don't have the insight to be able to do that very effectively. We have to have an educated and intelligent citizenry, which 
I regret to say, we don't necessarily have at the present time. I think it's also underrated how like Errol Morris here, like when he's like sort of when when uh, Langan is saying something a little off the wall, he's making like the camera subtly shift, you know, like as if this is like a, a you know like a crazy mirror of some sort. It's it's like it's like seeing a, a cartoon character with stars swirling about the head. Yeah. Got <laughs> you have the opportunity to run the world. You hear like the little dopey music in the background yeah. <laughs> as he's about to answer this question about bum, the bum, opportunity bum, to... Bum, 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 bum. <laughs> How would you do it? Oh, well, one of the first things that I would do is I would institute something like the Manhattan Project for a safe, long-lasting means of birth control. Simply implant that in all children at age 10. That would solve our population problem right off the bat. It would also enable us to practice a benign form of eugenics or i should probably say anti-dysgenics let's let's and what a let, terrible let's, like, play, let's let's invade people's bodies and do that rather than educate them if if we have more equal distribution uh, uh you know one of the the best ways to to cut population growth and it's been shown over and over is to have educated women countries that have higher education levels for women birth rates go down yeah, and also, I mean, like, obviously, like, uh, if you look at um, places all over the world where you have many kids, well, so many kids end up dying, right? So you're going to have to keep making them, making them, making them in the hopes that a few of them survive into adulthood. My like, Fiona, I can walk! <laughs> that, that, yeah, that'll be, that'll be, like, another part of it, but... Strange um, love. <laughs> wait, what, is this supposed to be, like, a, like a, a line of Jews going into, like... No, I think, it, I, I think it, well, it, it might be. I don't... Uh, I think it's just people just lining up as corporate drones somehow. It looks like a 1930s kind of uh, oh, Fritz yeah. Lang kind of thing. Prevent undesirable genetic mutations in the human genome. People who wanted to have children would apply to make sure they had no diseases. And also, like, in terms of being a communicator, like, the, the phrase he coined here, anti dysgenics like, what? That's really going to catch on, right? anti dysgenics like, you have literally a double negative, taking a familiar word, oddly, like, doing something with it that He's just seems very, that, that's is very, like, counterintuitive. Creative. Yeah, exactly. Like, this is, this is, this is what, when he mean when he says that he's, you know, he's good with language, this is really I am going to call white anti-black. Yeah. Which we'll, we'll see in the social media stuff. There's black people and anti-black people. Either we have to do it through genetic engineering, or we have to let only the fit breed. We like to think that it is our right well, this to might be a breed as incontinently as we want to. We have as many kids with whomever we want to. Future generations of mankind are being saddled with the results of what we do. Or don't do. Freedom is not necessarily a right. It is a privilege that you have to earn. A lot of people abuse their freedom, and that is something that people have to be trained. So if you have to earn it, that means you're indentured. Yeah, you're exactly. Indentured. Yeah. I mean, in an ideal society, obviously, everyone is born with equal freedom. And to the extent that you go through all kinds of violations, right, um, then maybe your freedoms are taken away through incarceration or like whatever else, right? But, you know, like he... And like, he really and, doesn't understand, again, yeah. the implications. That's like the... Uh, if freedom is a right or, or is a is a privilege then you have to earn it and if you have to earn a right it isn't a right therefore you are i mean uh, how uh, go on keep, keep keep it rolling but who who does this training well i'd be i, I, I love morris yeah he's got that, that he's got that woody allen guy. but but uh, who are you who are yeah. you? you know i can i can see this is like sleeper yeah to do but who? Who does this training? Well, I'd be perfectly willing to do it myself. <clears throat> Just put me in charge. Now, he, he thinks that was, he thinks, we, he, when he said that, he was probably thinking he was just being joke. Oh, I can't say it. Uh, but somewhere deep down, there's a kernel of him that wants that. Yeah. Well, it's not a kernel. I think that's like the entirety. It's not just a kernel. <laughs> that's the that's the whole thing here. We have to have a philosophical framework, an actual ethical structure that we can look at and say, well, this is without a doubt the right way of thinking. Within that framework, we derive an advanced ethics, an ethic that can be taught without fear, 
in elementary school, grade school, secondary school, and in our colleges and universities. We have to start looking for possible alternative sources of leadership. I don't see anybody on the top of the heap now who is capable of doing this. They've all been co-opted by the system. They have too much to lose by deviating from what is now a barren path. It's going to take somebody else, so somebody coming in from outside, somebody uh, rising to the top from the bottom, shall we say. Could it be you? Who knows? It could be you. And like the, the total like dishonesty really gets me. I mean, he does not mean it could be you. No, he's talking about himself, right? Um, and, you know, he postures in the one hand that there is this kind of, you know, almost egalitarian quality to some of what he's saying, like rising from the bottom to the top. It's all meritocracy. You know, he to whatever extent, you know, he believes it. like he's he's motivated by all this other stuff. Right. And I, this is it's, it's a good it's a good thing that this kind of documentary is out there. Right. But could you provide such a framework? Yes, I could. I've already done so. Cognitive theoretic model of the universe, the CTMU. It shows that we're all a part of the same universal self. All men are related in ways they can't necessarily discern on this plane of reality. We're all the same. We all share a basic fundamental identity with each other, which means that we should all be trying to help each other and cooperate with each other to make this a better place to live. As it is now, everybody's trying to run his own show here. We can't have that. But everyone would have to agree. Well, it's kind of hard to disagree with the premise that two plus two equals four. Yes, because there's a logical connection between getting everyone on board with how to run a society and simple arithmetic. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. Like he's saying the CTME was just like, you know, it was just a set of logical proofs, guys. This this and this proves everything. It's an ethical system, it's a cosmology, it's like a thousand things. It, it really is a theory of everything. Hey, you know, when I saw this, when I watched this yesterday, if you look down, I think the sixth or seventh comment, there's some guy says, boy, Joe Rogan should get this guy on his show. Yeah, like like let's, let's just look at the some of the comments. Like, I just want to sit down and talk to this man. Like and that's the thing. Like he really is. Like if you look at his Go social down, media, there, there yeah. be, there, I, I'm sure. I maybe it's different because uh, you're looking. But someone says says this guy would be perfect for Joe Rogan's show. Maybe maybe it's hundreds of comments. Yeah, oh, yeah. Ro Rogan, Rogan is having this. Dude on his yeah. <laughs> and who's that? Um, said that. Ramy Gore. <laughs> and that's the, th that's the thing. Like, if you look at his social media, if you look at how he conducts his Facebook, uh, he has a ton. Even more so than Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson has like, you know, these fanboys that probably have all kinds of personal issues. But the people like in these comments and on his Facebook, they really are just like totally unhinged. <laughs> all mostly like young men with like just problems. Like, I just want to sit down and talk to this man. Like, what do you think you're going to get out of this? Like, I don't, I don't like I, this is not the first thought that I think when I watch this video. Well, um did you did, didn't you say here or something that he has sock puppets? Are they part of the people who run his Wikipedia? About oh, yeah, he, yeah, 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 yeah. He does. Like, for example, on his Facebook, this is the crazy thing. Like, on his Facebook, he has this. Um, so he has like a, a, a bunch of people that are that he considers his kind of like go to, you know, grunts, right? He, they they sort of like uh, if there's like trolls or whatever, they fight them back. You know, they they sort of, you know, suck up to him nonstop. And you know, he, he he says things to them like, if you're going to show up again saying this kind of stuff, I'm going to excommunicate you. He really is like adopting the language of Christian fundamentalism, right? He's adopting um, uh, the language of a cult, right? We could say like Jerm B. Peterson is kind of like a, a cult figure guru, but this guy's even more so with the way that he conducts his online presence and his fans, right? He's he he he's taking on this this uh, really high falloon language of religiosity, um, and it's you know it, like but do, like but, but do you have you have you has anyone ever accused him? I mean, you said sock, sock puppets. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sock but, puppets. But a sock yes. puppet, I thought, it is him using many different names. Uh, yeah. Are his sock puppets, you mean that he has people who, who are his acolytes? 
Um, he has actual acolytes and then he has like fake accounts that he makes, whether it's like, you know, take, taking IQ tests that he could prepare for and not like, you know, dox himself before he's ready, you know, like all kinds of stuff that he does. Like I, I've basically seen enough stuff like on core and elsewhere where people are trying to like put together these like little clues together that, you know, he, he, he does like some fishy stuff basically. We have to establish a fundamental basis for agreement. Otherwise we're going to end up using up what we have and killing each other over the remains. Humanity is going to perish. Faith is dead. People no longer have faith in anything. So we're going to have to make logic do where faith once stood. This is free time. <laughs> A world of pure mind? Yes, we can call the universe, for want of a better term, the mind of God. God is the principle of consistency, the principle of cohesion, that holds the universe together. We're all little pieces of God. We're all one. This is nothing new. That's been thousands yeah. of years. In such a world, the ultra high Q, what role do they play? They are no better and no worse than anybody else, but they do have more responsibility. And they also have more privileges, right? Again, they fuck everyone. They rule everyone. They make decisions for everyone else. I mean, like, again, like, I, I don't know to what extent he's he's not aware of this. Maybe he's generally not aware of it, but it seems like a very kind of savant type thing, right? It seems like it's exactly the sort of thing, a person with a very high IQ who can't follow like a very kind of like basic logical pattern, right? Despite, you know, being able to do so, if you give him a bunch of puzzles, he'll be able to figure that out. But he's not able to understand that uh, what he's talking about just will not cohere. Even in the logic of his own system, it doesn't work. Yeah. By virtue of their greater ability. Problems that they can solve that can't be solved by other people, it naturally falls upon them to solve those problems. That's what high intelligence does for you. It enables you to hold many different things in your mind simultaneously and all their interrelationships. I would hope to hold the whole universe in my mind. That's the dream of a lot of people. A lot of physicists, a lot of cosmologists, a lot of theologians and philosophers. And me. Maybe he shouldn't have broken up that far fight. What would that feel like to hold the whole world in your mind? It would feel pretty good. <laughs> Holding the whole world in your mind makes you God? As I think I explained, every human being is an endomorphic image of the mind of God. So yes, not with the power of God, not with the extent of God, I would still have to be humble in sight of God, but I would have a certain theic identity. I would share an ultimate essence with God himself. These vessels of meat, these prisons of flesh, they have windows. We can get a view to the levels above by looking through the window of mind, the window of intellect. One day we'll all be able to take a good long look. My through God, it's 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 the space uh, the space the child from two thousand and one. Can be a valuable step in the evolution of mankind. Cue the blue den by providing reportage that that window exists out of, out of what can be glimpsed through the window. Is this a priesthood of intellect? An elite who have the ability to partake of those higher levels. An elite, yes, damn it, Mars. There's uh, probably an Stay element with of me. priesthood to it. A church. Not based on faith. A church that's based on logic and mathematics. A basis for cooperation that cannot be destroyed by religious quibbling, by theological differences. He doesn't seem to understand mathematics as a language. It's not, it's not something that yeah. has any real world equivalent. Yeah. Have you ever met someone smarter than yourself? It, as near as I can tell, no. And if somebody walked up right now and claimed to be smarter than me, 
I'd put him through his paces. I'd try to find out how sophisticated a picture of reality he'd evolved. Imagine being questioned by this guy about your, like, you know, thoughts about reality. Mm-hmm. And he's, like, constantly, like, you know, playing uh, word games with you. Like, oh, what do you think about God? You know, like, you know. Well, like, I think in that last segment where he had the planet Earth there, he was having music that, that made me think of Thus Big Zap. It wasn't as dramatic. I don't. I think I think if he had used the Spake Zarathustra, uh, he would have given away his hand. Uh, I, I think Langan doesn't realize he's being mocked at this point. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, uh, d- during this conversation, right, like there's no like I'm sure as he sat down, right, Morris probably wasn't like over the top needling him. But when you do yeah. the composition after the, the fact, right. It, yeah. yeah, But it, it is an open question. Like, I wonder if he were to watch this now would he be like i'm being mocked or would he uh not understand that you know let me tell you chris because if if google's algorithms work and alex's show here gets up there you were being mocked by errol morris whether you knew it or not yeah try to see what he was holding in his mind simultaneously and what he could do i wouldn't give him necessarily an iq test I'd look at his production. Ima- imagine giving him one of your poems or any poem for that matter and asking him like, okay, can you explain this to me? What would he even say? Well, it's like, I, I go back to Frost, the road taken, uh, uh, you know, and we we disagreed about free will and whatnot, but I, I think, uh, I think uh, Frost, the road taken, well, I don't want to get off on it, but that's a poem that's very uh, misunderstood. And I think that's a poem that actually does speak to free will or something. To someone like him, he couldn't understand that even on either side of that equation. He couldn't yeah. even understand yeah. that it's about that. He would just, you know, it's like someone who looking stopping through woods on snowy evening. Oh, that's that's about uh, a, a Christmas sleigh ride, you know? I, I, I remember one time I gave uh, some guy uh, the William Blake poem, The Fly, which I just, you know, it's one of my favorite poems. It's very wonderful. And he read it and he was like, I don't understand this. And I'm like, what do you mean? What is there to understand? Uh, but there's plenty of people like that. Am I capable of understanding his productions? Is he capable of understanding mine? That's his Lex Luthor yeah, pose. The yeah. His yeah. eyes. You know, I, 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 think of, I think of Lex Luthor from uh, uh, the Superman comics. He's a, I, I mean, the, the more, uh, I have to say, I, I didn't, I knew Morris was ribbing him a little bit, but now watching this in slow motion with you, you know, it's a 30 minute video. We spent an yeah, hour yeah. on it or something. He is, de- I mean, he is eviscerating him. Yeah. To, to that were in his favor, then I'd have to say he's more intelligent than I am. But that wouldn't the necessarily camera. stop me from doing what I have to do. Yeah, we, we went from a canted view to re- <laughs> Could be, I don't rule it out. I'm not in complete control of reality. But I will be. be. somebody a lot smarter than I am out there. There could be an entire planet full of beings, every single one of which is a lot smarter than I am. I can't say. But I do know that in my life, I have not encountered mm. many people with the depth of understanding that, uh, that I have regarding certain things. In particular, the overall nature of the reality we inhabit. Why don't you display that? You had 30 minutes. <laughs> Do I think that makes me better than everybody else? No. I still work in a bar. How good could I possibly think I am? I mean, the, you know, and this is another thing, like, uh, in terms of his, like, dishonesty. I mean, he works in a bar, uh, well, at this point, right, in uh, in 1999, because he has to, and because he feels that he hasn't been given what he deserves, right? There's nothing, if, if this is, in fact, what you feel about yourself, that you deserve much more than working at a bar, um, you will, you know, th- there, there's nothing that will preclude you, therefore, from thinking that you're better than other people if you you know, if that's the, the kind of thing that you that you entertain, right? If you entertain those kinds of thoughts, right? And this is very obvious to like tease out logically, just like if you think about it for five seconds. And the fact that he thinks that he's so smart that he could like trick the viewer into not understanding that this is in fact what he's thinking. Like, it's just very odd, right? Well, the thing is this, this whole thing 
he talks about a logic and whatnot, but he, clearly he's a metaphysician in his mind. And you you have this quote that, and I, I'll just read it uh, unless you wanted to, about his concept of evil, where in his CTMU, I guess this is the way he took it, it says, evil is incoherent because it's anti-existent, it hates existence, and it wants to go out of existence. When you take a bunch of evil and it won't recognize its own existence or the existence of anything else, it's very hard to coordinate. So it becomes incoherent. The only way that evil achieves any sort of reality is because it uses physical systems and uses their structures, their hierarchies in order to be realized. Now, now, number one, the first thing, he's anthropomorphizing a concept. Yeah. I mean, as if it, as if it's a bona fide, as if it's like, uh, as if it's like the SARS COVID-2 vac, uh, uh, virus out there causing COVID or something. Um, and, you know, it, the evil, and even, even, but even if you accept that <laughs> ridiculous metaphor, what he's saying is, is basically just gibberish. The only way that evil achieves uh, any sort of reality is uses physical systems, uses their structures, their hierarchies in order to be realized. What? Even if we were talking about a virus, that makes no sense. And, and well, for, first of all, like in, in any kind of you know discussion of evil, um, I, I don't even think that this is like yeah, this is not in the CTMU. Like I was, I actually searched through every single document okay. that he that he's published. Uh, and I couldn't find this code anywhere. So like, he just sort of like, he just sort of says this, like in an interview, he doesn't okay. explain, he does not even, you know, condescend to explain whether or not the concept of evil is legitimate. I mean, like a lot of, you know, a lot of philosophers, you know, don't even necessarily believe, believe in evil. I think that if you're going to engage with something like this, at least you're going to have to like set up some kind of definitions, right? You're going to have to like deal with this concept as a concept. You're going to have to refer maybe to like what other people have thought, rebuff it, you know, amplify it in some way, like whatever you want to do. But he just kind of like throws it out there, you know, as a given, you know, evil is this thing, evil, you know, is using, and that's the thing and you're like, you, you could, you could, I think sort of, uh, you know, make out what he's saying, but you would have to imbue a lot of your own prior understandings. Like when I, you know, uh, listen to something like this, you know, the only way that evil achieves any sort of realities because it uses physical systems. I think of like, you know, maybe what, what Nietzsche might say in terms of, you know, uh, 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 setting up things that are greater than, lesser than, you know, something that's constructive versus destructive, something that is destructive by its nature, um, you know, it's 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 going to be lesser than, like, but that's like my own priors and my own, like, understandings. But he needs to start with a set of definitions first. He needs to make sure that they're coherent. He needs to, like, even explain, like, like what, what is evil anyway, right? Like, it's just amazing that none of this is defined. Like, everything is taken as a given. He spouts it off, and by spouting it off, he assumes that it comes into some sort of material reality, which is just so, weird. So, let me, I mean, I don't want to spend so much much time on the CTMU since we did this, and it, it's, it's basically nonsense, but you had said it. So in the CTMU, he asserts, you say, reality is a language and there's a syntactic grammar which exists prior to anything else, putting into motion a self-referential universe which can be came from, come from nothing. So, uh, and I, I remember similar things like that, but like I just said when we were watching the video, mathematics is a language. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's not metaphorical to say when he says reality is a language, that's clearly a metaphor. It's not yeah. a language because there would have to be cognitive beings beyond the real state. Uh, so but mathematics is a language because and I'll give you a perfect example. And I'll use a, a blue collar example. Uh, for the last few years before uh, this uh, this last year, I was uh, running a dairy department. I've run dairy departments for three different companies. And. I know, for example, when I ordered milk, for example, uh, I was able to hit 98% of the time exact amounts where I could have enough on the shelf that, that I, it was easy. Uh, we never ran out of things because of my ordering, and I would have enough uh, to wait until the next delivery got. Now, anyone else in, the, in all the companies that I worked with couldn't do this. Now, I was, it wasn't because I was looking at the numbers, although if I looked at numbers, I could see patterns. Literally, if I, could, if I looked at a shelf and I knew what I had and, and I knew what needed to be, uh, we needed to have till the next truck, I had a, sort of a quantity, but it wasn't a numeric quantity. It was literally I could see the amount of milk. And then in order to, to, to put it into the system, I couldn't say, you know, well, I, I make up a word, moo amount of milk or, or, or chaka amount of milk or this amount. 
I, I would then have to say, okay, this is how much we need for this kind of milk. And I would say, boom, boom, boom. And I would go cut it down and say, okay, I need uh, at least 70 a half gallons of this milk uh, to last us till the next one. And then I would translate it. So I've always said to myself, if you have some other kind of intelligence, non-human intelligence on a planet where there aren't discrete objects, let's say you have an intelligence that evolves in some kind of creature in a gas planet where they, they can't necessarily uh, uh, say, oh, here are five rocks or here are the, you would have someone you would have some kind of an intelligence that would be beyond our or a totally different kind of way to view the universe rather than our mathematics. When I was able to, to when I was able to order so well, I had to transfer a thing that I, I could get, uh, uh, you know, whatever I need to be ordered into the, the mathematics we used. So I, there was no, there's no difference between that and translating a poem of mine into Portuguese. Mm -hmm. And another thing, like, you know, I, I, I definitely get the sense, like, reading other scientists or whatever, uh, like, there, there, there's very often this envy that people outside of the arts feel, right, towards towards artists, right? This is just like, I, I, you know, like, I'm sure you've noticed the same thing. Like, it strikes me very much, like, when someone says something like, reality is a language, you're just trying to get, you know, the halo effect of the word language, right? There's something, you know, big about it. There's something about it that's like, you know, even more complex, right? Reality to a lot of people, it's like, all right, it's a boring word. I know what that means. It refers to like, you know, everyday fabric, whatever. By saying reality is a language, you're just trying to recreate something that is like, you know, boring or baseline, uh, into something else that has this like, you know, halo effect, right? You're trying to like essentially leech off of it. You're a parasite off of these other concepts, right? And he, do he does this a lot, right? So like reality is a language is like the first part of his uh, thesis. Another thing that he says is there is no object subject distinction because they are interdependent. I mean, that's not very, I mean, like Buddhism sort of says the same thing. Like it's, this is a little new, this is like old shit. Uh, then he switches from that to say the universal mind is thus generated, which is God's mind, and everyone else is a slice of God. You pointed out this also is not very near complex. This is just like you know another means of you know a pro proving God's existence by essentially saying that God is everything. I mean that's not you know that that's not a a, a very you know complex thing it sounds it's like not, something it's not Jim very Morrison would have said but said a little bit better in a door song yeah he would have you know he that's the, that's the thing you could say this kind of shit if you put it into a poem because then you could refract so many other meanings you could put under right you could subsume so many other items and you could do it in a way that's novel you could do it in a way that's unique you could do it in a way that's interesting this calls to mind you know, the worst of academic writing. Like this is exactly the type of shit that, that Jordan Peterson did in his first book, right? So, and, and the funny thing is that, you know, he, um, uh, Langan says some negative things about Jordan Peterson, but they have a lot in common, right? Um, so did you, do, before we go go to the next subject, you, you had listed you uh, had some things, crazy things he said on his Facebook page? Oh yeah, let, let, let's just like take a look let's at his look um, at so, social media just briefly. Uh, Facebook or Twitter? Which one is it? Uh, it's Twitter that like gives that goes off to like Gab, right? Gab. So Gab is like um, Gab is a is a social media platform for people that are afraid they're going to be booted off of Twitter for saying crazy shit. Um, mm -hmm. and like, like, so th this thing is just like, like parlor is gab like parlor. Yeah. Kind of, like, kind of, yeah. Kind of like, it's just kind of like full of, um, and that's the thing. Like I I'm actually like really into the idea of alternative, like social media platforms. I don't think something like Twitter is, is good. I want there to be like other things, but the problem is the kinds of people that tend to get booted from Twitter, uh, are people that eventually congregate here and start like a Nazi, you know, party of some sort, you know, like that's the, the anyway. So this, this, this call my attention. I, I, I thought it was very weird, right? Just like the premise is weird. So he's sharing this video of this guy at a store, right? So like in terms of like, you know, critiques of, you know, uh, COVID-19 restrictions, this is one of the things that I would agree with. So he shares this video of this kid at a store 
he's uh, trying to smell a scented candle to see whether or not he wants to buy it. So he very briefly, no one's around him. He very briefly pulls down his mask. He smells the candle and suddenly, you know, all these people kind of like jump up and they're like, you know, what are you doing? Put the mask back on. Like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Right. Just completely like losing their minds. Right. That's not something that's appropriate. I don't think this is the sort of thing that would cause people to be very resentful of restrictions they might otherwise have tolerated. So anyway, um, you know, like, so that's the point being made in the video. I have no issue with that point, but this is the way that he phrases it. He begins by saying, ever get embarrassed because of your skin color? Personally, I'm embarrassed to share the same skin color as the aggressively officious little mask Nazis in this video. It's mortifying in a world where all kinds of superior minority types and their libtard facilitators are constantly criticizing whitey for this and that, right? Um, and so that's because like all these white people show up and they demanded this kid put the mask back on appropriately. But like... When I walk down the street and I see a white person, I never, ever have any thought in my head of natural camaraderie. I don't find white people to be naturally my comrades. I know that the baseline person of any race is going to have very different value system from me very different thoughts in their heads, very different things that they want to do, very different programs that they want to sign on for, right? Very different, like just uh, viewpoints about the world. But he sees a white person doing something that he doesn't like. And this kind of gets into this kind of like more, you know, race science stuff that he's gotten into in his later years. He sees a white person doing something that he doesn't like. And to him, this is like now a cause for shame. Like that is not normal. Like I, I, like I don't care like about all those other stuff. CTMU. Like just by just judging this kind of post, this is not a normal, emotionally stable response, right? Like it's just, it's just, it's just so weird. Um, yeah, I and, see. I see on the right side the Neil Young, Joe Rogan thing. I was looking at that earlier this morning. I was laughing my ass over that one. That uh, Spotify prefers to ha have uh, Joe Rogan, not that I'm a great Neil Young fan, but uh, I mean, uh, here is the perfect example of capitalism uh, supporting this kind of stupidity, Joe Rogan, uh, Mr. Ivermectin. Uh, yeah. But he, he brings in money because you have all the troglodytes that are going to want listen to it. And I wonder, has, I wonder if Chris Langan uh, ever has been on Rogan. I don't know. But I uh, know he, he hasn't, he hasn't been, but he could definitely, I think eventually he'll go on. I mean, um, yeah. I think Rogan would go for, for something like that. Um, and here, here's more kind of like, you know, uh, like co like COVID-19, like anti-vax shit, right? Like, uh, he's, you know, he's claiming that, um, if you get the vaccine, you might be get you know, putting prions that eventually get into your brain. Like, you know, like how, how like, you know, mad cow disease creates those prions yeah. that anyway, it's, you know, it's like cr cr like crazy shit like this and just like, you know, just like baseline. So like baseline, uh, so this is his, his Twitter, right? This is what he considers to be good writing. So here you have, like, it, it a, looks like that's from Morris. His, his his it looks like that's from that morris video the, the thing the little oh yeah could be yeah 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 exactly 20 some years ago yeah yeah um, that's, that's from the morris video yeah so so like he thinks it's an example of good writing so first of all the images of like a sword right this like really like going back to like old like western civilization type stuff and the quote is it's time to sell that cloak buy a sword learn how to use it and develop the clarity to know when you have no other choice but to do so cooperate with evil and you can forget about heaven right and he has like you know he put he puts his uh his name right under the quote because he doesn't want it stolen <laughs> yeah well i mean it's like it's like this is george R. R. martin level thinking that i you know on that uh game of thrones kind of, of level thing that is i mean th this is shows how just lowest common denominator he actually is i mean come on I mean, oh God. Like there, there, there's this, uh, there's this other quote about Nazi Germany. Nazi Germany was an evil reaction to an other pre-existing kind of evil. Unfortunately, while Nazi Germany has disappeared, the coherent evil that inspired it has not, and this is a large part of our current problem. Um, and I, I was trying. Not, he's not talking about. I, I, clearly, he's talking about communism or socialism. Uh, yeah. And and I mean, come on. I mean, it's like. The reason the Nazis uh, came to power originally when they were national socialists, they were socialists before Hitler and his bunch took over that party. 
they were national socialists. They were for everything that socialists stood for. And uh, they were against the, the, the corporations in Germany. It's only when Hitler got in, uh, took over the party with his minions that they had Kristallnacht and they had the, the gay purge or whatever night that was called uh, uh, and, and all that. I mean, uh, we j j just read to the responses on the right of his acolytes. Uh, somebody is, I was thinking exactly about this today, actually. Hmm. Uh, let, let me see who, who liked this. Was it Chris Langan? No. Have you ever oh. tripped? Someone asked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like serious question. Have you ever tripped? You think this is serious? And then someone else. Six gorillion, right? Someone like making fun of the idea that six million Jews died. Um, so like you have like you know you know, like Nazis and the you know in the in the comments as well. Um, like you could pull like any any one of these like fucking quotes, right? And you're gonna get some like totally and why is like, a man now stuff. pushing seventy? Why is he using these icons where he's f still flexing his muscles from twenty five yeah. years ago? Well, I mean, he, that, remind, that reminds me of Carolyn Forche, the poet pastor, when she was like my age now, 56, 57, using her book cover where she was a hot little 28 year old. To be fair, he's still he's he still looks pretty good and in shape. Like he's still you still see his um his uh, in that interview that he did with that Asian guy. Like he you see his like uh, gym equipment there. Uh, so he he looks good for his age. But also you could tell like from the interview right that he's someone that had that takes a lot of pride in his body. So um you know he's gonna do this like Neil deGrasse Tyson type of pose, showing off the muscles because I mean this is I mean look look, look at this quote. God is existence. Satan, on the other hand, is intentional anti-existence or evil, which can be simplistically defined not just as the opposite of God, that which would, if it could, cancel godly existence, but as a psychological tendency to self-annihilation and various scales of existence. Like he, word salad. Word yeah, salad. he he calls himself he, he he like he's constantly talking about how poor communicator scientists are, and then he comes up with some shit like this. And what? And, and I guess that's supposed to. He couldn't find any good images of hell, so a California wildfire. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's creative. Um, uh, and then, and like more like race type shit, right? So discrimination against Western majorities is implicit in post 1965 U.S. immigration policy. That's why we get almost no immigrants from Europe, and this makes multiculturalism as racist as can be. Well, first of all. The reason why you get no immigrants from Europe is they don't want to fuck. Why would they want to move to America? This is a developed continent, right? They have their own education system. And if system. you were from behind the Iron Curtain at the time, you have yeah. you, you could come in easily. I mean that. I mean that. What this is go. What he's talking about here is is when I was a kid. I've mentioned this before. The the people who worked uh, in sweatshops. We're not Latinos back in the 50s and 60s, but mm -hmm. they were Slavs who came over. Yeah. Uh, and so they they cut they cut they cut some of that down, unless you could prove that you were being uh persecuted uh by communist regime, whether it's in El Salvador or Cuba or behind the Iron Curtain. So even this is 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 not totally honest. Yeah. Um and also th this kind of you know touches on his other claims about like, you know population control right he he does want to see a depopulation right i mean uh why like why would you bring in more immigrants that essentially don't want to have kids right if you have a you know a growth mindset let's say right in the economy right this is this is one of the problems in places like europe right they're not uh they're 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 very limited in their growth and this you know this is reflected in the stock market it's reflected in, in other things but anyway it's like you know you, you look at the social media and you think like you know the this is a guy that was called in various outlets in the 90s, like, you know, the, the smartest man in America, right? It's just, it just shows you how limited and limiting IQ is. Like any IQ fetishist, like this is, this really, this is the apex kind of that he wants to see, right? This is, this is the, the top, the top of the hierarchical, hierarchical society that he wants to establish where he gets to call all the shots. And we see just kind of like baseline, like what, when he's not like sort of presenting things for, you know, uh, a 1990s audience where he has to like dress up and, you know, be in front of a, a TV screen when he just has like random little like social media thoughts to like fart out on Twitter. It's just this like random assortment of just total nonsense, right? I just, I, I just saw, I just saw this hashtag says self simulation. I, I actually misread it as self stimulation. I was like, I was like, that this, that this whole thing is, 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 he's like, I guess he's got uh, his own 
uh, circle jerk with it, he himself, yeah. me, myself, yeah. and I, and then with his little acolytes. 